All right, we're going to get started. And uh, this last Wednesday, Robert kind of, uh, he's been going through the Godhead. And uh, before Des left, he was doing some basics of right division, but maybe get some couple thoughts uh, that we were talking about and discussing through there. And um, as Robert said on Wednesday, get ready to, to kind of flip through your Bible because we're going to go through quite a few verses. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some things that kind of just came to my mind as I was studying. And uh, as I was studying, get to the right page here. You might not see me flipping my Bible because I like to kind of copy and paste because I can't, I'm kind of blind, so I need to make big font. <laughs> You'll see that as I go through here. So um, let's have a word of prayer real quick, okay? Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you this morning. We're thankful and grateful to be here with our brothers and sisters in Christ and to study your word. Uh, bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. So one, one thing I, was, I began to think about was, uh, you know, Jesus was never called Jesus by his disciples. They never just came up to him and said, like, you know, I might say, hey, holla, you know, let's get something to eat, right? So the, never in the scriptures do you see the disciples address Jesus as Jesus. So it was just something that came to my mind. So I started and this kind of morphed into my study. So Jesus was never called Jesus by any of his disciples in the gospel. He is referred to us as Jesus by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, as they identify in the gospels, you know, the things he was speaking about and uh, if there was something he said, they were referring to him as Jesus. But never directly did they talk to him as Jesus. Jesus is always addressed as Lord, Master, Messiah, Rabbi, Rabboni, teacher, the son of the living God, the king of Israel, or as the Christ. Never as just Jesus when they're talking directly to him. Uh, there's only one time in the, in the Gospels was the name Jesus ever used by any of his disciples in his presence, and that's when they were walking unknowingly uh, along the, uh, the road. And look, go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 17. Luke 24, 17. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto him, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all his people. So not knowing they're talking to Jesus, they mention Jesus to him. But that would be the only time you see his disciples ever do that. And even here, Jesus isn't called by his name personally. They did not know who they were talking to, so they were simply using his name to identify Jesus and who he was to them. However, the name Jesus is used directly to Jesus himself by a devil. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 29 Matthew 20, uh, 8, 29. So, this is, this is by a devil. He says, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Okay. So the name, the name Jesus is mentioned by the multitudes to identify to those asking who it was as he entered into Jerusalem, but they addressed him personally as the son of David as he was approaching the city, not as Jesus. Look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21 and verse 11. 
says, and the multitude said, I hear pages, so I'll wait a second. And the, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So the name Jesus is mentioned to Peter by a damsel in Matthew 26, if you want to go to Matthew 26. And again by, the, by a maid a couple verses later, as each of them tell Peter that they saw him with Jesus... But these women did not speak to Jesus personally or call him by his name. So look at Matthew 26, 69. 26, 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou, thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. And then a couple verses later, verse 71 and when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto, him, unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. All right, Pilate uses, uses Jesus' name when addressing the crowd at his trial. One chapter later, verse 27, I mean chapter 27. And Jesus' name is used on a sign that was nailed to his cross along with the title, King of the Jews. But Pilate never calls him Jesus personally when talking to him. Okay, Chapter 27, verse 17, Matthew. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barnabas or Jesus, which is called Christ. All right, verse, tw verse 22. Look at verse 22. Pilate saith unto him, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. Okay? All right, an angel mentions Jesus' name at the tomb in Matthew 28, we'll go another chapter over, Matthew 28, when talking to the woman who, who were there, but again, they did not speak to Jesus personally and call Jesus by his name. Look at verse 5, 28, 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women, to the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Again, Jesus is used, but not personally. All right. Let's go over to Mark chapter 10. In Mark 10, there's a blind man named Bartimaeus, and he is the only human being to say the name Jesus to, to Jesus in all of Scripture. And immediately the disciples basically told him to shut up. All right, Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of uh, Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. So literally, they're telling him to shut his mouth, right? Be quiet. But he cried the more a great deal, and, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me, right? So Bartimaeus, the son of Timid, uh, Timaeus, responds more by calling after him without using his name, though, but identifies him by one of his titles, the son of David. And then Jesus heals him. I, you know, I started to see a pattern here. Do you, do you start to see a pattern? Because I started to see a pattern as I was uh, going through this. Let's look at the account of the, of the ten leopards. You know, ten leopards, go to Luke chapter 17. Ten leopards use the name Jesus. 
along with the title master, and Jesus heals them of their leprosy. Here's a rare uh, exception, and notice the nine Jewish ex-lepards never returned to give, give him thanks because they were not his disciples. Okay? Look at, uh, starting verse 11, and we're going to go down to verse 19, but I'm going to read from 11 to 19, if you're writing these verses down. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were leopards, which stood, stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving thanks and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were not ten cleansed? But there are I mean, but where are the nine? There are not found they are not found the return that return to give glory to God save the stranger. And he said unto him, Arise and go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. So you see another disrespectful encounter. Really, these, these nine are healed, and really they don't come back and glorify God. And when they are dressing Jesus, they're not his disciples to begin with. So it's another disrespectful encounter, and they're calling him, you know, Jesus. You know, they believe that, he could, that he, he could heal them, but they would not follow him. The one that did return was a Samaritan, and that would be considered a half-breed back then. Right? Jesus himself utters his own name as he addresses his father in John chapter 17. If you go to John chapter 17. In his prayer, and in interestingly enough, he adds the title Christ when he refers to his name. And this is Jesus. John 17 verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Okay. So as I began to study that, I started to think about some of the titles that Christ had. Uh, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul reverenced Jesus, but he called him the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that Paul's our pattern. And, uh, you know, in the four Gospels, Jesus is never referred to as the Lord Jesus Christ. But our Apostle calls him that 71 times in the, in, in the Pauline Scriptures. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at what it means to be the Christ. Okay, the words the Christ appear 19 times in the scriptures. And one of the most important things we learn from these scriptures is that the Christ is also equal to the Son of God. Uh, and it will... And it was commonly known amongst the learned Jews that the Christ would be the Son of God. So let's go back before Jesus died, before the cross. We're going to go back to the prophets concerning the Christ, and we're going to compare what the Scriptures say that he would do and say. Before we do that, I'm going to try to put some meat on the bones and look at what some others believed about Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew, Matthew 16. And we'll go down to verse 16. It says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, 
the son of the living God. What did, what did Peter just call Jesus? The Christ, the son of the living God, right? Look down at verse 20. Verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So, who did Jesus say that he was? He said he was the Christ. When Jesus said he was the Christ, what else was he saying? Because he was saying he was the Son of God. And then you'll, you'll have certain religions that popped up like Jehovah Witnesses. They don't believe Jesus really is the Son of God. And uh, it's amazing because really being the Christ equals the Son of God. Matthew 26, 63. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. And by the way, Jesus was agreeing with Peter back there when he, in verse 16. Peter was saying he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Four verses later, he's saying he's Jesus the Christ. And he didn't correct P, uh, Peter, so he's agreeing with Peter as well. Okay? So look at Matthew 26, and Matthew 26, I forgot to put a verse on here, so I'm, uh, Matt, uh, let's start in verse 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it? which these witnesses what what is is it which these witnesses against thee and Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him I adjure thee by the living God that that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ the son of God so the high priest knew the Christ is the son of God all right the the, the high priest knew that so like I said before the learned Jews, it would be commonly known amongst them that the Christ equaled the Son of God. Look at John chapter uh, 1. John chapter 1. Go down to verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew... Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So did Andrew think that Jesus was the Christ? Of course he did, yep. As Des would say, yes or yes, right? Okay, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And start at verse uh, 39. And many of the Samaritans that the city of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he should tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many believed because of his own word. Now, verse 42. And he and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So what did the, what did the Samaritans know about Jesus? He was the Christ. Not only that, but he was the Savior of the world. Okay, in, in the prior dispensation, prior to ours, I would say, one had to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, to be saved. You had to believe that to be saved. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And 
we're going to drop down to verse 30. John chapter 20, verse 30. And the, the signs that are written in the Gospels or in the, in the Gospel of John, John's going to explain why he wrote these down here. So, And many other signs did G truly did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So why were these signs written? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, right? So certainly John believed that believing on the Christ is how someone would have eternal life, right? Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. You guys with me? First John chapter 5, verse number 1 says, Who, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that be, begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. A little bit of a tongue twister there, but John says that by believing that Jesus was the Christ would make a person born of God. So the word Christ is the same Hebrew word as Messiah, as the Messiah. And that word has a meaning of the anointed one. So we we'll also find the word uh, Messiah with a kind of a Greek translation in the book of John. And that's in uh, John chapter 1, verse 41. We were, we were over there earlier. If you don't want to turn back there, it's John 1, 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah. That's the same word as Messiah, but that's a Greek translation of that word, which is being interpreted the Christ. So we found the Christ. In chapter 4 of John, verse 25, it said, The woman saith unto him, We know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. So just pointing out the word Messiah is the same as Messiah, meaning the Christ, the anointed one. Prophets, priests, and kings were all anointed for a service. And Jesus held all three of these offices according to the scriptures. What exactly does it mean to be the anointed one, the Messiah, right? So that means you're going to be set apart, just like a prophet, priest, or, and king in those offices. So can anyone tell me how many times the, the, the word Messiah appears in the Scriptures? It only appears in the Scriptures twice, and it's in the same chapter of Daniel, chapter 9 of Daniel. Let's go back, let's go to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to learn some stuff here in Jan uh, Daniel about the Messiah. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Everybody there? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to, re to restore and, and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince shall be Seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary 
and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the cons consum consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So from these wor uh, verses, this is where you find the two times that Messiah is mentioned in these, uh, this scripture here. But from these verses, what do we learn about the Messiah? What do we learn about the Christ? We learn that he must be anointed, right? We also learn that the anointed one is also called the most holy Notice the, in the word holy, it's a capital H and for holy in that verse. So to anoint the most holy was to anoint God. The Messiah, the anointed one, was the most holy. So Jesus Christ was the most holy. Anything else we can learn from these scriptures, you think? The Messiah was also identified as coming at, a, coming at an exact time in history. After 69 prophetic weeks, which is 483 years, the commandment to build and restore Jerusalem, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. So we see this decree to build and restore Jerusalem, that's recorded in the book of Ezra. And uh, that happened somewhere around 450 B.C., Okay, so you got 450 year 450 BC until the coming of Christ. Add Christ's age at when he died or when he's cut off. That's 33 years, and then you come up with 33 AD or 483 years. So that is the 69 prophetic weeks that we're talking about here. So he's coming at a certain time in history or future at that point. Okay, so this is speaking about the 69 weeks of seven years each. So I'll give you some homework. You can study this by going to Genesis chapter 29. And it's about Jacob serving Laban for uh, Rachel, his wife. So you can study that a little bit on your own to learn about the uh, seven weeks at the 69 weeks of seven. Okay. In Daniel chapter 24, it says that a time was coming to anoint the most holy. Then we can be certain that Christ, the Messiah, would have to be anointed, right? We can be certain of that, right? Was Jesus ever anointed? Of course he was, yep. And he was several times, actually. But the one, uh, but his first anointing was like any other one, anyone else's. You know, there's a prophecy concerning Christ being anointed, and we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. We're going to start right in the first verse. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort, comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. According to Jesus' own words, this was fulfilled partially when he was reading the scriptures in the synagogue in, in Nazareth. And that's going to be in Luke chapter 4. You guys can go to Luke chapter 4. Uh, but also grab Isaiah chapter 11 in one hand and Luke 
chapter 4 and the other hand. So we know it, uh, Jesus was anointed as baptism, in, and that's in Luke chapter 3. And then, then he's tempted of Satan, and he goes driven into the wilderness. And, but back at his baptism, the Spirit descended in the form of a dove and alighted upon him. And that's, let's look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod uh, out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make quick, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Okay, let's go back now to Luke chapter 4. And this is after he comes back from the wilderness being tempted. And in um, and, and verse 14, verse 14. Verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Verse 16, and, or, yeah, verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered on him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and rec recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to and he gave and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear, witness, bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Caponium, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Saripia, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many leopards were in Israel in the time of of Isaiah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saying, Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the, the bow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Okay? Now, the actual physical anointing of Christ took place at his baptism, and that was in chapter 3. Okay? And he filled the first half of what we read in Isaiah. He, filled, he fulfilled the first half of that by preaching the good news unto the poor, healing, healing the brokenhearted, preaching deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, setting at liberty them that were bruised, and, and preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. Let's take a look at a priest's anointing, compare it with Jesus' anointing of the Holy Ghost uh, at his baptism. So let's look at a 
the way a priest is anointed. And we're going to go all the way back to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. You guys with me? All right. Hopefully this was intriguing to you like it was to me. If not, I was really truly blessed by studying this. So. Exodus 29 verse 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hollow them. What's to hollow them? To make them holy, right? To minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock two, and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened, unleavened tempered with oil and wafers unleavened anointed with oil of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them in a, into one basket and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water. Now you see, that's where baptisms are from. It's from the, this, this point here. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and all this other stuff that they've done with Aaron. Verse number 7, Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint them. So the priesthood of Aaron had, had many restrictions to it, uh, which could not be violated. Where, what are some of the restrictions? Or I'm gonna, I'll tell you, you know, here are f at least five that I know of. Um, you had to be from the tribe of Aaron, which were the Levites. You had to be without blemish. You had to be 30 years of age. Number four, you had to be washed with clean water. And number five, you had to be anointed with oil. Okay, that was the anointing of the priests. So if we go back and we take a look at how Jesus was anointed, back, let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. I'm not wearing your fingers out, am I? All right. Matthew chapter 3. And let's start in verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So first, the priest had to be washed with water, and then he was uh, to be anointed, as we read in Exodus 29. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was a descendant of Aaron. He was a son of a Levitical priest named Zacharias. So what did that make John? It made him a Levite, right? Jesus was then anointed with the Spirit of the Lord alighted upon him. All of Israel had to be baptized with water. And then they would receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Right? So they could be priests in a kingdom that John and Jesus was preaching about. And it was preaching that the kingdom was at hand. And uh, so you ended up, but they, uh, you know, they rejected their king, sadly. They ended up killing their king and rejecting his kingdom, which they were going to be king, they're going to be priests and kings in that, ki in that kingdom. Which is why it's been, uh, you know, this has all been on hold now and Dispensation of Grace has now opened up for us. Thank God for that, right? And uh, while the king is in exile, 
seated at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. And if you want to write Psalms 110 down, you can look at that for the later reference for yourself. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost. Let's look at, let's look at Acts chapter 10, verse 37. I'm going to try to wrap this up soon. Acts chapter 10, verse 37. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So to be anointed meant to be set apart to do something special. Prophets, priests, and kings all were to be anointed with oil before beginning their public ministry of their service. The difference was that they were anointed with oil while Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost to be Israel's high priest. Quickly look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4.14. 4, I'm going a little quicker because I'm trying to get to a nice spot here. Seeing then that, that we have a, a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, right? And it's, they have a high priest. Thank God we have a head of the body. We today in the dispensation of grace are anointed with the Holy Ghost the moment we believe and are baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ. Second Corinthians one twenty one. Now we which established now he which established us with with you in Christ and have anointed us is God, who have also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Jesus was anointed before his burial with, you know, by Mary, the one he cast out seven devils with. Uh, he will be anointed as king when he returns and puts down his enemies. So there's multiple anointings. So it's clear that Jesus was anointed as a priest. Let us now, I was going to start to look at you know, that prophet. There was a, in the scriptures they talk about that prophet because Jesus was pre a prophet, a priest, and a king. So, but I think I'm going to wrap it up here. This is a good spot to stop. I hope that you guys were benefited by that. Okay? Thank you.